So for this video, I thought I'd just take a quick look around one of the classic Amiga machines in my collection, the Commodore Amiga 600, that was released back in 1992. Now, um, when this machine originally came out, it did get quite a lot of flack because it did replace the uh, much-loved Amiga 500 range. Now, the reasons for Commodore releasing this, in hindsight, are quite obvious, but at the, at the time, it got absolutely slated because people thought it wasn't really enough of an improvement over the Amiga 500 line. It literally came out probably around five or six months before the more advanced Amiga 1200 machine, and originally at the same price range, it was released in the UK at £399, at the same price that the Amiga 500 sold for, and then the Amiga 1200 just, you know, a little bit later on in 1992. But looking around the Amiga 600, we can see there are some quite nice features to the machine, including the fact that the um, the footprint of it is really small. If you compare this to an Amiga 500, you know, you're literally talking less than half the footprint on your desktop, not only in uh, width because it lacks, you know, the numeric keypad, but also the uh, depth of the machine as well. The Amiga 500 went back, you know, at least another good third on this machine here. And also some nice features are integrated into the Amiga 600, which over time have actually improved the usability of this machine in the long term, including the, um, at the time, the much hated PCM CIA slot. Now, um, this card slot here, originally it was um, spoken about in magazines, they called it a credit card slot, and it uses um, standard PCM CIA 16-bit cards. Now, I've got a 4 megabyte PCM CIA RAM card in here that was um, picked up off eBay for around £30. It's not the quickest interface in the world, but um, for a machine like this, which is based on a Motorola 68K 7 megahertz processor, it's more than adequate for using as fast RAM. But also, one other advantage that we've got in um, 2011 is the fact that you can buy a little interface like this, which is a um, PCM CIA2 compact flash adapter. Now that means that you can download ADF files from the internet, also uh, other kind of files that you might want to transfer onto your Amiga, put this into your PC, literally slot it into this um, card reader, and then just um, put that in the side of the Amiga 600. And then using a FAT32 driver, you can literally read the contents of these cards on um, on your Amiga 600, which at the time when the uh, PCM CIA interface was quite new, back in 1992, these cards were retailing for you know pretty much the cost of the machine. If you if you wanted to buy like a two or three megabyte compact flash card, um, a PCM CIA card rather, you're looking like, you know several hundred pounds. So at the time, people said it wasn't really a viable interface, and they were a bit concerned as to um, you know the the direction the Commodore was going, because the Amiga 500 had a proprietary edge connector and none of the peripherals from the A500 were compatible with this machine. But obviously as time has gone on, we do realise that this was actually a really good choice for Commodore to make. Now uh, looking around the machine, on the side of it here we have the standard 9-pin um, D connectors for joysticks and also the, uh, the mouse that would fit in there as well a 3.25 inch floppy drive as well. It's kind of a weird little angle which originally coming from an Amiga 500 before this I was always putting discs in that way and kind of you know hitting it in the wrong angle but you get used to it rather quickly. Uh, on the back the standard Amiga ports we have um, from the left to the right an external disk drive connector, a serial port here, parallel uh, phono ports, uh, a video port there as well which can be used to connect to uh, an RGB monitor um, or these days it's quite good if you want to get um, a SCART connector or a VGA, you'll come from this connector here. A colour composite port, the RF modulator and the uh, standard Amiga power adapter there too. Now some more interesting things lie in this machine uh, on the inside of it, so if we um, if we can take this apart, hopefully the uh, longer YouTube time limit will allow me to get this machine open quite quickly. And I'll show you some expansions that I've actually um, put inside this machine over the years as well that have helped to expand it into a much more usable machine. When I originally got this back in 1992, I really couldn't even have imagined the uh, kind of things I'd add to it over the years, considering it originally came with a 20 megabyte hard disk. And that retailed for 499 UK pounds, which at the time was very cheap for a 20 megabyte hard disk included in the machine. I mean, you go back 12 months before that, if you had an Amiga 500, to buy the external Amiga 590 
20 megabyte hard disk that's slotted on the side, you're talking an extra £399 for that drive alone, which was um, actually the same price that we full machine retail for. So, you know, in hindsight, it's simple to see why Commodore did make some of the decisions that they did, even though they weren't very popular at the time. Now, the 600 is held together with um, a series of little tabs that you need to unclick around the edge of the case. So I can get them all open here. Then we uh, lift it up in there. And there are actually a couple of ribbon cables connected under here. One of which I'll need to remove to uh, get it open, if you'll bear with me. The keyboard connector at the back. So I'll just um, try and pull up quickly. I need a screwdriver to help me out. There we are. So the keyboard's disconnected now and the LED's at the bottom there. So this literally just pops away. I've removed the internal shielding on the machine. It did originally ship with an RF shield, but I mean, I've found no problem since removing it. Now the um, upgrades that I've done to this machine, I've added a, um, a chip RAM upgrade, an extra one megabyte inside here that um, will give me two megabytes of chip RAM by standard. And then with this PCMCIA 4 megabyte expansion, that gives my Amiga 600 a total of um, six megabytes of RAM. Looking around the uh, motherboard as well, we have the uh, Amiga Kickstart ROM, I believe that is, version 205. Um, this machine actually shipped with uh, Kickstart 37.300 that a lot of people have written about online saying that it's um, an early version of Kickstart and it can only support 40 megabyte hard disks as maximum which is actually a complete lie as you can see here I've got a 4 gigabyte compact flash card in this machine partitioned into two 1 gigabyte partitions on here and it runs absolutely fine so if you are maybe shopping around for an Amiga 600 don't worry about getting it with um, Kickstart 37300 it will run completely fine on that larger uh, disk drives in there. Now that's quite an interesting fact as well that because um, these compact flash cards, a lot of the range like the Transcend cards and also the um, see the card I've got as well, the SanDisk range as well, you can actually use them as IDE hard disks and even though four gigabytes wouldn't be very big in a modern day PC or a Mac for the Amiga range, you know, that is absolutely massive considering this machine originally shipped with a 20 megabyte hard disk and I've got a four gigabyte card in here now and it would have been a solid state drive as well the boot times were even quicker, everything loads a lot faster from it as well. Now it's not really fitted in the most elegant way, I do admit. It originally um, shipped with a two and a half inch IDE drive in here, in this um, little dock that's in here. Literally all I've done is um, put some masking tape over here to insulate that. And it looks a bit flimsy here, but obviously when the keyboard's on top it's all kind of pressed down together. And it's not shorting anything out, so it's, um, you know, it's quite sturdy inside as well. Uh, looking around the board as well, the Amiga 600 was one of the first Amiga models, if not the first, to have a completely surface mount technology board as well. Whereas on the previous machines you could, um, you know, basically unplug the chips and change them if you needed to. Not that there was really many options for it, but on this machine to save money and also improve reliability as well, pretty much all of the chips on the board, apart from the Kickstart ROM, which was user upgradable, um, are all surface mounted which um, apparently did improve reliability quite a lot. I remember at the time Commodore were actually one of the first computer companies to offer an on-site service warranty with the Amiga 600 range simply because they believed in it that much and it would you know have very little breakdowns and to this day you know most Amiga 600s I've seen have outlived Amiga 500 machines. This now would be what we're talking now 19 years old this machine and it's still performing as good as the day I first bought it. Looking around as well, we've got the M5, uh, the three and a half inch floppy drive here, by the way. Uh, still functioning fine, never had to replace that. Also got a, um, a standard battery in there as well that serves as a battery backed real time clock on the machine too. So as you can see, you know, for um, someone who might want to buy an Amiga machine and kind of have the best of the classic range, the Amiga 500s and the, six, uh, the 1000s rather, before you got into the AGA machines, I think the Amiga 600 these days is actually a really good choice. Not only because you get the option of having the built-in drive, put a compact flash card in there with four gigabytes, and pretty much I've got every Amiga game loaded with WHD load on this card here. So I boot my machine up, I've got all the folders sorted alphabetically, which I'll show you in a moment. I play them straight off that card, and if I want to download anything off the internet, literally it's a case of putting this in my PC, slotting it into there, and then inserting it into the Amiga 600 and I can take the file straight off it. So I'm going to put it back together and give you a little demo of um, some of the applications I've got installed on the compact flashcard. Now there is almost something a little bit perverse about plugging a uh, almost 20 year old machine into a a 50 inch 
plasma TV, but the, actually the picture, picture quality with my little um, RGB to SCART adapter is surprisingly good. So I've gone handheld for a moment just to kind of, you know, make this video a little bit more free. So we'll just move around the back of it here. Um, I'm going to try and do this well, oops, <laughs> while holding the camera as well. Not the easiest job in the world. So we, um, we take the power brick here, which um, all the desktop Amigas, the uh, small um, wedge shaped machines like the 500, the 1200 and the um, 600, came with a separate power brick um, that bizarrely for the time actually has the um, off and on switch located on the power supply itself, which at the time was a little bit annoying. I always found, you know, if you located this under the table, you'd often kick that, which may, may just be my stupid feet, but you know. So all you do is you uh, literally plug this into the back of the Amiga. And then with this um, little RGB adapter that I've got, so we just literally put that into the monitor port on the back here into that. Connect the audio as well, it's got you know stereo audio in these machines. They go into uh, two separate ports there. Hopefully you're not too seasick. And then um, we take the mouse as well. I bought a third party mouse for my Amiga. I was also a big fan of the Logic 3 Speed Mouse. I bought a few of these back in the day. They were switchable between the Atari ST and the Amiga. Um, being an Amiga fan, I never owned an Atari ST. And I'm trying my best not to spit while saying the name. It was a bit of a fanboy thing back then. Um, on the side there we have two ports. We have a mouse and two game, which is for the joystick. So we put them in there. And the machine should be good to go. Now, uh, this machine originally shipped with Workbench version 205. I have upgraded that to version 2.1, uh, which was literally a software-only upgrade. But it did give uh, version 2 some of the new features that were included in um, 3.0. So, uh, but literally, I mean, the only thing I'm really using this machine for is for classic gaming because I do have quite a nice Amiga 1200 setup with an accelerator card that I'm waiting on this week and also a PowerPC Amiga 1 running um, OS 4.1 Update 2. So literally, this machine is my workhorse for gaming, really. So if, um, let's get a quick mouse mat off, uh, off over here, my table. Okay. Then you can see that I've, um, I've got this machine literally in two separate drives on it. Now, for example, if we wanted to play a classic game from back in the day, I've got all the WHD load files organized into uh, alphabetical folders. Now, WHD load, if you haven't heard of it, what it actually does is it takes the old games that you used to play on floppy disk back in the day, because back then a lot of the games weren't actually installable on the hard disk on the Amiga as an anti piracy you know, protection procedure. But what WHD load does is um, actually rips the games as files on your hard disk that you can then play by double-clicking icons. So you can download these from all over the internet these days, but they are, um, you know, they're a lot handier than having to mess around changing disks, for example. So I'll show you a game just as a quick example. Um, one of my favorites from way back when. And as you can see, you know, considering we're talking a seven megahertz machine with uh, just a few megabytes of RAM. I mean, looking at this, I think my, you know, my modern day quad core PC will probably open a folder in about the same amount of time. Maybe a little bit slower, but you know, for a machine of its age, you kind of, you know, it does keep up. I don't think I'd want to use it for HD video editing, but you know. Uh, Canon Fodder, always a big favourite of mine back in the day, if uh, only for the intro music as well, that was really catchy. And you can play the game as easily as, um, if not easier than the days when you played it off floppy disk, you know. Before you'd have to probably swap about three disk changes here, but it's loading everything off the combat flashcard. So I'd highly recommend the upgrade if you wanted to get an Amiga 600, now you can probably buy one off eBay. I think they probably go for the range of around 30 to 40 pounds in the UK now. The compact flash card, probably around 15 pounds for the card itself. The adapter is about four pounds. Uh, the RAM upgrade is still pretty pricey, but um, I mean, you're talking less than 100 quid for the whole setup I've got here these days. So it's, um, you know, it's not really an expensive investment these days. And it'll play the games as good as you remember them. That's been my uh, video review of the Amiga 600.